Well, it was almost a year ago. Lisa and I were back in Cherry Hills. I did a marriage conference here. And the talks were getting serious about me possibly joining the teaching team. And I must have talked, and I'm not making this up, at least two dozen people, elders, church members, even a realtor. So I have two questions about moving to Colorado. First, what about the snow? I was like, don't worry, we don't get hardly any snow in December, actually, and, and not that much in January. And here's the thing, the sun comes out the next day and it's gone in a day. So it's not like you're ever surrounded by snow very much. I thought, okay, but, but what about the cold? Oh, you might not realize this, but December and January in Denver, it averages 15 days of 60 degree weather. That's why the snow doesn't last very long. Uh, great, so let's sell everything we have and we'll move to Colorado and we'll point it out. I don't know if y'all lied to us or if this is just a really wacky winter, but if you did, I'm glad we're here because if this is a part of being in Colorado, we couldn't be happier. And so uh, thank you for coming out on a day that isn't 60, it was six when I drove in, but we'll see. Father, I just pray uh, that you would open up your word because you Lord, you call us to a beautiful life because we love, you love us. You want to call us from the ugliness of our own worst tendencies and what this world can be. You have such a beautiful place for us, not just to go to, but to be here. And I pray that beauty would come through. You use my words to paint your portrait and call us to a new life as we seek to reach a new level in 2023. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's say an uber wealthy billionaire, multi-time over billionaire, chooses you for an incredible opportunity. If you will climb this one mountain, he promises you for the rest of your life, you'll get $500,000 a year. You'll never have to work again. Now you're not in very good shape, but he's giving you two and a half years. The day that you have to do it, it's two and a half years away. So you figure I'm gonna spend a year getting in shape so I can get up that mountain. You don't have any of the gear, but hey, it's a great investment. You go to REI, you might spend thousands of dollars, but it's worth it. And then you know you're gonna have to spend a year training. The mountain is bigger than anything we have in Colorado, even bigger than all the 14ers. And so you spend a couple other months just working on those mountains. Then you hire a trader, a guide. He says, I can get you up there, we're gonna do it. Now it's gonna take a couple weeks, it's a high mountain, but we'll leave in time for you to get on that summit that day and you will be set for life. So for two and a half years, you're focused on that quest. You will get up that mountain. And then a couple of weeks before, you start to climb that mountain. And it's as difficult as you thought it would be. You kind of want to give up. It's cold. It's scary. You're sore. It's hard to sleep. But you're saying the payoff is going to be so worth it. So you keep putting one foot in front of the other. You get to the top on that day. And I can't even describe the joy, the exaltation. Yes, I did it. And as you get to the top, the guide looks kind of funny. And then he opens up his map again and he says, oops. You're like what? We climbed the wrong mountain. I'm so sorry. How ticked off would you be at that guide? two and a half years, thousands of dollars, all the opportunity you lost just because you climbed the wrong mountain. How furious would you be? But what if when you died, well, before you died, you're on your deathbed and you're looking back over your life and you realize you spent your entire life climbing a mountain that doesn't matter or a mountain that would have been better to climb a different kind of mountain. And you realize I've really spent my whole life climbing this mountain and, and I don't think it was worth it. I don't think it was the best use of my time. How would you feel at the end of your life if you'd climbed the wrong mountain? Half of what I do as a pastor is getting people to consider what mountain are you climbing and asking them, is it worth it? You're giving your time, your energy, your resources over to a particular mountain. Is this mountain worthy of your time? My wife and I were in Glenwood Springs some years back. I'd spoken at Focus on the Family. She'd done some research. She said, let's drive out to Glenwood Springs. There's a place called the Iron Mountain Hot Springs. Have any of you been out there? It, it was great. We had a great vacation to have all of these different 
hot springs. And Lisa and I were in one, and I'm pretty sure it was a bachelorette party that came in, because there were probably eight to 10 young women, maybe mid-20s, perhaps early 30s, not much more than that. They looked pretty young to us. And as they got into the pool, they're just talking away about all of the things they are doing to keep looking young. Now, they already looked young to us. They're talking about the lotions and the treatments they're paying for, the doctors that they were recommending. One of them said, yeah, all the Kardashians are doing this. And they're all nodding their heads and making mental notes. The mountain they're trying to climb is to keep looking like they already look. Maybe your mountain is money. You are determined you will die on a whole pile of money. If that's the mountain you're climbing in 2023, please go listen to Kurt's sermon last week. He did a great job putting that in a whole new light. Maybe your mountain is notoriety. You want certain people to know who you are. It could be a great achievement. I think of Johnny Miller. Younger people won't know him, but in the 70s, he was at one time the greatest golfer in the world. And he said his goal in life from time he was a little boy, as he was a teenager, he would practice, he would work, he would sacrifice when other kids were doing other things because he had a dream, I want to win a major. I want to know what it's like to win a major. And so when he finally did in 1973 and he sunk that putt on the 18th green, becoming the first golfer at the time to score a 63 in a US Open, It was time of great celebration, but even that evening, just that very evening at dinner, the sense of, this is it? I gave my whole life over. I thought this would make everything make sense. This is what I sacrificed for, and and, and this is all I get. Whatever mountain you're climbing, I just want to ask you, is it worth it? Now, God promises that there's a mountain you can climb that you will never regret. If anybody climbs this mountain, they'll be lifted up by it. It will be worth their time. So as you think of the mountains you can climb in 2023 to reach the next level, I'd like to suggest we follow God's lead and climb the mountain of wisdom. The mountain of wisdom. Proverbs 4 says this, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, more than a few thousand, it might cost all that you have, even so, get understanding. Cherish her, she'll exalt you. Embrace her, and she'll honor you. She will give you a garland. That's a sign of victory. At the end of your life, instead of being, was it worth it? Or I have this US Open trophy. I'm not sure it's up to what I thought it would be. It promises you will have a garland to grace your head and a glorious crown. God's word says a mountain you will never regret climbing is a mountain of wisdom because if you embrace her, she will exalt you. If you pursue her, she will honor you. In other words, there isn't a single person who will regret climbing the mountain of wisdom. It always pays off. Now, it's not an easy mountain to climb. It doesn't happen by accident. It's gonna cost you something. Though it cost all you have, get understanding because it's worth it. It might cost you some sleep. It might cost you some screen time. It might feel like you were working when you just want to take off, but it's saying, if you'll give yourself to this, it will be more than worth it. So the beginning of wisdom is really this. If we become convinced that of all the mountains I could climb in 2023, the one I want to make sure I climb, I am wiser in January of 2024 than I am today. What amazes me is how even biblical characters, even those who wrote our scriptures filled with so much wisdom, had an intentional and vigorous pursuit of more wisdom and learning. Fascinating, at the end of Timothy, Paul is writing to his young friend, 2 Timothy 4.13. In a very personal level, Paul writes this, Timothy, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, Also the books and above all the parchments. Now this is near the end of his life. 
What astonishes me about his desire to read more, he'd already written Romans. He had already written Ephesians. And I'm just in awe that a guy who wrote that still thinks there's somebody else to read. Those are such brilliant works. I mean, I think, why would I read her? I wrote Romans. Why do I care what he has to say? I wrote first and second Corinthians. I mean, those are such brilliant works. And yet Paul, even though he had written them, still said, there are other books I need to read. We don't know for sure what books or parchments they were. Most scholars would say, almost certainly it was other parts of what we call the New Testament today, the gospels and other letters. And Paul still felt he needed to read them, which tells us this, even those who wrote the Bible read the Bible. The very people who wrote the Bible, they themselves read and studied the Bible. In a wonderful commentary on this, Charles Spurgeon is talking about how amazing it is that Paul is so earnest to read other books. I want you to help me read his quote. Whenever I say the word yet, I want you to finish the sentence with he needs books. So let's practice it. I say yet, and you say, you're great. All right, here we go. Paul's inspired and yet, he's been preaching for at least 30 years, he's not a rookie. And yet, he had seen the Lord. And yet, he had had a wider experience than most men had traveled over all the world. And yet, he had been caught up into the third heaven and had heard things which it was unlawful for a man to utter, yet, he had written the major part of the New Testament and yet he needs books. This is why it's so astonishing. Paul had experienced things you and I will never experience. He had literally seen Jesus on the Damascus road. He could see Jesus. He could hear Jesus. He had a conversation with Jesus. He had been lifted up into the third heaven. Next to Jesus, the only one that had done that where God let him see what heaven would be like. You wonder about his zeal, his willingness to sacrifice. He knows how the story ends. God gave it to him and yet God said, but you can't tell about that. You can't share what this is. He'd had more experience, more spiritual insight than any of us could dream of having. He knew things that no other human had ever known and yet he still believes he needs books. He still needs to pursue wisdom. He still needs to shape his mind. Why? Well, he shows us the foundation of that when he wrote to the Romans in chapter 12, verse two. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. How do we avoid that? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, in Paul's worldview, and I believe it's true, the world isn't neutral. It is trying to shape you. The novels you read, the music you listen to, the movies you watch, television programs, the news, what you get in academia, it has an agenda. And the world's agenda is this. You will love what I tell you you should love. You will hate what I tell you you should hate. You will be concerned about what I tell you you should be concerned about. It has an agenda for you. It will squeeze you. It will shape you. It will mold you. And Paul says the only way out of this, if we're just passive, we'll be molded. But we fight back by being transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's how we do it. That... The, the world may use shame. It may use a mob mentality. Everybody thinks this way. How could you think any different? It's ridicule. Really, seriously, you believe that? But it is determined to get you to do that, which is why when I'm talking to young people online, or young people here, if I could give you anything, and this is, this is the generation I grew up in. This is what young people used to do. Question groupthink. Second guess common wisdom that everybody says this is the way things are, including this sermon, including what Kurt teaches. Check the scriptures, evaluate it, because if it's true, it'll stand up and you can have confidence. But if it's not true, you won't spend your whole life climbing the wrong mountain and at the end saying, I can't believe they said that's the mountain I had to climb. And it so 
wasn't worth it. And the way you fight back against that, the way you fight back from being conformed to a world that has its own agenda for you is to transform your own mind. Paul is saying this, either the world shapes you or you shape you. Something will shape you. You can choose what will shape you and what you think should shape you or you just go along and you're just fodder for a world that says they don't even suspect it and you will hold on to the world's values. Here's what I found. Those who have made a difference in the world first made a difference in their minds. Before they could shape the world, they were intentional about shaping their own minds. That's where world change begins. I have a son who got two master degrees from Harvard University. My wife doesn't like me to say that. She says it sounds like it's bragging. Here's how much it's not bragging. I went to Western Washington University. I really can't brag. Somebody else out there, we got a Viking. I, I checked just for the other one alumni. It was listed in one thing as like, I think the 374th university in the nation. So when Graham got into Harvard, I sent him a text message, bud, way to go, keep up the tradition. We both got into top 400 schools. You didn't dishonor your family, you kept it going. I'm really proud of you. Um, but the reason I stress that it's Harvard is because, because it's Harvard. They get le guest lectures from everywhere. I mean, the education is great, but I mean, they have financiers, heads of state from other countries, the great artists, um, business leaders, whatnot. Russell Wilson actually gave a lecture when he was still with the Seahawks that Graham went and heard. I mean, they just, they, they get everybody. And so Graham was home on a break and Graham would take advantage of those lectures and I saw he was reading this really thick book. He was getting an MBA and I thought it wouldn't really relate to that. And then he went to the Kennedy School for Public Policy. I thought, I don't think it would relate to that. So I said, but, but what's up with this book? Because I know he's reading a lot of books already. He said, Dad, well, all of the super successful people that came to Harvard had one thing in common. I'm like, now I want to know, what's that? He goes, they read a lot of books and they only watch a little bit of television. And I figured if that's what the world shapers do, Maybe I ought to follow their example. And I see him live it out today. Charlie Munger is one of the most successful investors of all time. He works with Berkshire Hathaway. You've probably heard of Warren Buffett. They're, they're simpatico, they work together. Here's what Charlie Munger said. In my life, I have known no wise people who don't read all the time, none, zero. His partner, Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, is famous for spending 80% of his schedule reading books. His goal is to read 500 pages a day. And when he's talking to a graduating class, he's trying to tell them, this is the pathway to success. Read 500 pages like this every day. That's how knowledge works. It builds up like compound interest. He knows what he's talking about, when he's talking about compound interest. All of you can do it, but I guarantee not many of you will. There are tens of thousands of investors who won't have half the success of Warren Buffett who will say, I don't have time to read. I can't do that, I've gotta make decisions, I've gotta contact clients. And Warren Buffett says, see, not many will do it. Everybody can, but they won't. They won't have this kind of success. Now, the interest of disclosure, I don't read 500 pages a day and I kind of get paid to read a little bit. My goal is 50, some of them are long books and whatnot. And I realize it's different depending on your occupation or whatnot, but here's the challenge that all of us can take on. What Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are saying and what my son noticed by the successful people at Harvard is that you can do less, but read more and achieve more. Maybe one of the keys is that you read more, do less, but end up achieving more because you're wiser, you're making better decisions and you go farther. And, and I, don't, I, look, I don't want this to sound like it's just worldly like business, not that there's anything wrong with business, but it's not just about getting rich, it's making a spiritual impact. I think of John Wesley, I, I know I keep mentioning him, I'm a big fan of him, he lives such a, beautiful, sacrificial life. God used him to bring revival to this country. 
And while he was known to pray a lot, which is important for work, the work of God, one of the things that they were really known for is shaping the mind and reading. If you were a circuit riding preacher with the Methodists during the time of Wesley, you got up at 4 a.m. to read scriptures on your own until 5 a.m. You had breakfast and got ready from 6 a.m. to noon, 6 a.m. to noon, that's six hours. You would read from what Wesley called the Christian library. It's a collection of books he developed talk about the Christian life and prayer and scriptures and whatnot. And you would build up your mind every day to go on. And the reason he did that, some of those circuit riding preachers could preach one, two, three sermons a day. And he made the point, you can't keep giving out if you're not taking in, you're gonna get empty. You're gonna just start giving your own opinions or you're gonna be conformed to what you gotta keep taking in so that you can give out. And I know some of you might say, well, I'm not preaching one, two, three times a day. Like, are you not? Maybe not here, but are you a parent? Are you a public school teacher, principal, a counselor, a friend? This world is so desperate for people who can think clearly that if you will fill yourself up with wisdom, God will bring the people to you. There will be plenty of sermons to preach. God is looking for oases of insight and understanding that you can be a signpost, that God can bring people to so that you can preach that sermon. But that's why we have to develop our own minds first to be able to do that. So if you wanna succeed, you wanna make an impact, This will sound so radical. It will sound like so countercultural, but maybe you want to try it. Try to read and listen more than you watch. Most people won't do that. But if you really want to shape life, try to read and listen more than you watch. I just read recently of a prisoner who went to prison very young. And in prison, he was watching television all the time. And he said, basically, he was talking to other prisoners about how to up his crime game, learning tips and what to do and how not to get caught. Then he attacked a guard, got sent to solitary confinement, where they take away television privileges. And all they gave him was an AM radio. And he got sick of listening to the same songs because they kind of have the same playlist. So he started listening to this one radio program that, that he said changed his life. I can live differently. He looked at society differently. He looked at himself differently. And he got out and he just said, I'm a different person. I I got away from the television. I started listening to wisdom and it changed the course of my life. And I say this because it's been shown scientifically too much screen time makes us stupid. I mean that, they've shown the studies. Too much screen time literally makes us more stupid. There was a study, 2015, in the journal Cerebral Cortex, I'm sure you all get it at home, you might have missed this particular issue. Too much screen time, they said, actually lowers your IQ. It frustrates language acquisition. Parents, something to really keep in mind, a battle worth fighting, if we want our kids to develop intellectually. It increases psychological difficulties. You have more anxiety, you have more stress, more depression. It reduces attention. I see this firsthand. I've updated almost every one of my books and without fail, every time the publisher says, shorter chapters, shorter books, people just can't think through it anymore. And it reduces your ability to manage anger. Nielsen has the TV ratings, estimates that the average American spends nine hours a week watching cable news. Now, it's really not that much. If you think you watch a program and a half a day, you're gonna hit nine hours a week. But compare that. If you talk about the average American Christian time they spend in church, okay, an hour and 15 minutes a day, and prayer and Bible study, it won't come close to nine hours. You know what, I don't really care which side you're watching or which network it is. The question is this, do I want some executive producer from New York, I don't even know who he or she is, 
Do I want them to determine what I should care about, what I should think about, what I should hate, what I should love, what I should fear, or what I should want to see happen? Am I gonna just give my mind over to that? Or do I wanna sit back and think, who are the teachers I wanna listen to? Where is the source of wisdom that I can most learn from? And I, I know, look, I'm not, I, I've talked, Lisa and I have our series that we watch. We love The Amazing Race and some others. But screen time is dessert. After you've done your work, you've studied, you've built up your mind, a little dessert at the end of a meal can be a good thing. But here's the thing, if you only eat dessert, what does that do to you physically? You're gonna be sick. If all you do for your mind, if the only thing you feed your mind is dessert, if that becomes a main meal, you will be sick intellectually. You will believe lies you will be shaped and conformed to the image the world wants you to have. Because see, as opposed to screen time, reading strengthens neural pathways. It increases our IQ. It helps us to handle other emotions. But here's what's really sad. One study said that 42% of college graduates, college graduates, will never read another book after they graduate. Solomon doesn't say pursue wisdom until you're 22. Seek understanding until you get your degree. Because as soon as we stop shaping our mind, the world starts shaping us. It must be a pursuit throughout our life. Now it's not just reading. I think that's the most economical form. And as a writer, I'm probably gonna go there. I know there are other forms. Today, there are many ways you can pursue wisdom. Besides books, there are lectures, there are master classes. Uh, if you, like me, were only able to get into Western Washington University, you can still hear lectures from people from esteemed universities. They're available all the time. There are podcasts, and I have entertainment podcasts that are fun. I have some in the morning that go deep into scriptures or just shaping my mind. You can get great podcasts, more sermons. I, I think for most of us, one sermon a week isn't enough. And if you're thinking Gary just didn't bring it today, you've got dozens of other great options on the internet. And then we offer midweek classes on Wednesday nights here. I teach a seminary class on Tuesday night here. Can you give up one evening of watching a series to pursue wisdom here with other believers? But one of my favorites, meaningful conversations with wise godly people. The scriptures talk about this. You really want to grow in wisdom, find wise and godly people and just talk to them, ask them, learn from them. Lisa and I have done this throughout their life. I've pursued this zealously as a, just as an individual. Let me just give you one example. About 50% of couples or more will be impacted by a blended family in some way. You came from one, you're trying to shape one, one of your kids will have one. There are a lot of issues that come up Ron Deal's books are fabulous to help couples through this. Um, there's a couple here that does curriculum studies with it that you can learn from. Tim and Cynthia, Lisa and I just met with them last week. They will meet with any couple that's thinking of becoming a blended family or feel buried by trying to shape a blended family. And if you just go through that, you're reading, you're studying, you're talking and listening, a little bit of wisdom can save you a lot of grief. They've been through it. They'll walk with you. That's part of the benefits of being a church member. And you could apply that to adoption. You could apply it to financial situations. You could apply it to so many issues in life. We just think, I gotta find out a way to do this, get busy. And the Bible says, well, first pursue wisdom. Let wisdom lift you up. Maybe do less, read more, listen more, and end up achieving more. Charlie, Munger, who we talked about before, years ago said this, I constantly see people rise in life who are not the smartest, sometimes not even the most diligent, but they're learning machines. They go to bed every night a little wiser than they were when they got up, and boy, does that help, particularly when you have a long road ahead of you. He's talking to people about to go out into the world. And he said, you might not feel like you're at the top of the class. Become a learning machine because wisdom is like working out. One physical workout doesn't make you fit, strong, and fast. 
You layer workout upon workout. Same thing for intellectual fitness. You read, you listen, you ask, you study and slowly grow wise and understanding. It's layer upon layer. Now for a believer, wisdom must begin. It gets to begin. We're so blessed to have God's word, the Bible. I don't ever want to present it as an obligation because it is a miracle that God has given us the word. It is so powerful. It is so true. It is so rich. And every word is true and God's mercy and love. It's amazing to me. I've been living in the book of Psalms. It reaches me exactly what I need to hear. Changes my mind. Changes my heart. It really is a miracle that we could have it. Jesus said to John 17, Sanctify them by truth. How are we made holy? How are we made perfect? Your word is truth. We need it every day. A resource I would really recommend um, if you just want to read through scripture and you don't feel like you're getting all that you need out of it. N.T. Wright. Um, N.T. Wright has this whole series, Paul for Everyone, the Gospels for Everyone. He goes through all the letters. It's a short little commentary. They're paperback, they're affordable. Great little guide just as you go through scripture to get the most out of them. Certainly worth your time. In addition to scripture, I love to read the Christian classics. I know that seems bizarre to people. To basically, you're reading old dead people. and say, why would you read that? Books today have a shelf life somewhere between yogurt and milk, right? They just, they don't last very long. But if a book has been around for hundreds of years, maybe even over a century, there's a certain power and anointing that people have. And unlike scripture, I don't agree with everything the classics say, but I want it to lift me out of my cultural blinders. I had a professor back in seminary said, Gary, you should read Teresa of Avila. I said, why? Because she's a woman and you're a man. She grew up in Spain, you grew up in North America. She lived in a different century. She comes from a different tradition. She will ask questions you won't even think to answer. And so reading the classics lifts me up out of my gender blinders, my cultural blinders, my generational blinders, my tradition blinders, and just helps me see the world from a different light. It had such an impact on my life. My first book was about the Christian classics. It's Thirsting for God that has the wisdom of the Christian classics. In the back is an appendix that lists the books that have shaped me the most. And I don't want you to have to buy a book to get that appendix. So we put it on the app. If you go to the Cherry Hills app, there's a link in the notes and you can get that appendix for free. Thanks for coming out. Uh, well, or even watching online. So the classics are a big thing, but it doesn't have to be just Christian books, nonfiction books. I love to read history. Kind of weird, I'm reading three biographies right now. I'm not usually reading three different biographies at different times. Guys, novels, literary novels are great to improve your EQ, emotional intelligence. As guys, I don't like to get sexist here, but we don't tend to be as emotionally aware as our wives. There are exceptions. Novels help us understand that. If I want to connect with people, connect with my wife, novels are a great way to do that. I've even read a study about the different ways that poetry reaches your mind. Now, I've tried many times to start. I'm not as good at that. But uh, basically, it's taking seriously Paul's comment to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Like you do different workouts for your arms, your shoulders, your legs. Intellectually, I wanna seek wisdom in every way I can. And you know what? I don't know that it's been ever more important than this year. And, and I think of Rome and it haunts me. If you go back to first century Rome, it was amazingly powerful and wealthy. Art flowed through it, political power, beauty, library. I mean, it's a place of learning. You would walk around in first century Rome and think, this is it, this place will never fall. But yeah, it, it did. The barbarians came in, the Huns, the Goths, the Visigoths, and they didn't just kill people, they killed the civilization. They destroyed all of the libraries and nobody had uploaded any of it to the cloud. I mean, it was gone forever. And by the sixth century, Europe was all but illiterate with no libraries to speak of and entered what we now call the dark ages. You think society has to get better and better and better. It got worse and worse and worse. What brought Europe back? What, if I could borrow a phrase, made Europe great again? 
Thomas Cahill, in an interesting book called How the Irish Saved Civilization, said it was a group of Irish monks who went everywhere they could to find books that still existed and they began to copy them. Of course, they didn't have printers and they would hand copy them and they began to build up libraries and Europe started to become literate again and it finally left the dark ages and eventually reaching into places like the Enlightenment. War brought Rome down, but ignorance kept Rome down. But wisdom lifted Rome up. Do we think we need wisdom today? Don't we kind of feel like in a way we're being invaded by moral barbarians? Group think, faulty thinking, where things are just like, it, it can't be this bad. Really? Lazy thinking? My, my wife and I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle people. And after we left, we would go back every year, year and a half, two years. And having been away, it was shocking to see the decline in a home city that we had loved. And then I think of Philadelphia. I had a daughter that moved to Philadelphia. Here are pictures from Kensington Avenue. Now to be fair, this is just a small section of Philadelphia. It's not all like it. This is really sort of the drug area that is allowed to exist. But you see the beautiful life God calls us to. And here you just see wasted lives in the middle of the day. People not even able to function. And that's not how God wanted it to be. But you know what? It's not just Seattle. It's not just Philadelphia. It's Denver. Here's a, just two years ago. Now, a lot of that was done right next to a school and it became a news item and so they cleared it out, but really they just moved it a couple blocks away. And, and what I wanna say to young people without trying to sound so old is it hasn't always been this way. We're starting to have where a generation has grown up with this. And I was shocked when one of my daughter's friends it kind of surprised me coming first just saying, coming back from Philly, I, I started to wonder, Maybe all these policies we supported, maybe they're not working. <laughs> maybe we need to try something new. And that's why I'm zealous for, for young people and middle aged and senior citizens to apply their wisdom and say, there might be a way out of it. There might be a way to think through this. Whether God has called you into politics, whether he's called you into business or the arts to create beauty in a world that seems to be getting increasingly ugly. My son who read those books has now been given charge by his company to rethink and rework. They own a bunch of companies to change the profit sharing plan so that employees get more of the profit than just the owners. And it's so energized the workforce where the owners end up making more. I mean, it's just an incredibly creative plan. Maybe reading all those books has paid off changing the way that business could work. So whether you're into the arts or education, or business, or our faith. What if you're the person God chooses to save civilization? What if your contribution is that where God says, I have a new era to bring through. And the reason I can have confidence is because in the history of the world, Christians have been some of the best thinkers. I think of Augustine. I think of Aquinas, Blaise Pascal, Isaac Newton. More recently, C.S. Lewis, who helped Europe get through World War II. Dorothy Sayers with so many insightful novels. Florence Nightingale. Some people just think of her as a nurse, but why she was so effective is that she began to apply statistics to medical care, revolutionize the way we treated diseases and injuries. God can do that through you. If you take in, you'll be able to give out. God is looking for the people who will do that. So this is, I believe, in 2023 to go to the next level, a mountain that God says you will never regret climbing. Read this with me, please. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Look, you're climbing a mountain this year, whether you know it or not. Just ask him, is it the mountain you wanna climb? Is it a mountain that's worth it?
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for not giving up on us, how your word can kind of just shake us awake. It's so easy to just drift along with the world, to be conformed. It's just easier. We don't face the battles. We don't have to resist it, but you want more. Father, maybe there's a young woman or a young man and you have such a call on their life and they've been drawn away. Or a middle-aged person that has really drifted and you're saying, no, it is time to wake up. Or a senior citizen that thinks it's just time to end, just relax and enjoy. And you're saying, I still have a mission for you. Father, it begins by pursuing wisdom. Give us your passion, I pray. Give us your heart. In Jesus' name. Amen.